So welcome everyone to another community call where the first topic we have today is an exciting one in my mind. I think uh, we're starting to get to the point where we may actually become a real business. So yeah, like one of the most important parts of being a business is you have to make money. And um, one way in that I think we can we can make money in a way that actually provides like a ton of value to the scientific community is the concept of like bounties for peer reviews. So we, we have like this post publication peer review feature now and like, you know, crypto in general, I think like bounties actually work really well. And, and one thing which has been pretty exciting is like on our D work, we like opened up a bunch of bounties for editors to like share peer reviews about papers. And we had a lot of like scientifically inclined individuals actually apply to like, kind of like take these bounties and draft peer reviews for scientific papers. And so uh, we're excited about this and that like, like there's a problem that currently exists in science in that like peer reviewers want to be paid. Um, this is like talking to a couple of like uh, scientists that work at journals. They're saying that like, uh, like PI level scientists are actually starting to decline peer review requests more than ever. And so like peer reviews are getting done by like grad students more than ever because like top tier scientists essentially want to be compensated for their time. Um, I don't know if you all have seen this, but there's also a Twitter account called the $400 movement, which is uh, run by James Heathers, who uh, this, this other Twitter account's amazing. It's called Justin Mice. And it, it tweets out like news articles that say like, oh, you know, like, you know, running 10 miles a day, like makes you live longer, but the study's actually in mice. And so it just criticizes like Psycom. It's really funny, but it's run by James Heathers, who's this meta scientist, and he like is advocating for journals to pay scientists four hundred dollars per peer review. So the opportunity to have like compensated peer review, I think, is like something the scientific community is calling for. And so with with our current post publication peer review feature, we can essentially allow um, anyone with research coin to place bounties on uh, creating peer reviews. Uh, you know, for for papers that have already been published, so post publication, and I think like the compelling use case here is um, like going back to like COVID, right? Like, um, like ivermectin. There's kind of like a debate about whether it could be effective for like uh, early treatment of like mild COVID, and there are a bunch of papers that came out that like said like, hey, like this might actually be useful. And then um, I don't know if you all are familiar with this, but the author of uh, Star Slate Codex, who's a psychiatrist. Star Codex. Yeah, Slate Star Codex. Yep. Um, I forget what's his name, Edwin. Do you know? Uh, oh God. I, he got he got outed a little yeah, while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did. He did. He did. Scott he did. Alexander. I, Scott I, Alexander. I should, Scott Alexander. Yep. Yep. And so he's like a, a really bright dude who knows like a lot about a lot of different topics. And so he um, like collected. It's essentially like all of the biggest papers supporting um, like ivermectin, you know, for the early treatment of COVID. And he basically went, went through each paper and like commented on the scientific validity. And I think there were something like 15 papers that like supported this idea. And like four of them were like, like worth listening to. And the rest were like underpowered or like running away where like, you know, it's tough because it, it was early stage clinical research, like uh, lots of people had lots of different treatments. And so just like the the findings, you know, you couldn't really glean a ton from them. And so, um, yeah, it's like this like public debate about the viability of this treatment where there had been a bunch of research papers, both supporting and like negating the use of ivermectin to treat like early mild COVID. And so like one thing that we think that we could bring to the table is essentially the ability for anyone who's like interested in like you know more professional criticism of these papers to put their money where their mouth is so like say like you know i'm kind of interested like i think there might be something to this like i could put 20 bucks you know towards like incentivizing like a scientist who's got relevant knowledge to like like criticize the paper from like an objective perspective like basically looking at the methodology, like looking at the findings, like do does the do the claims that the authors, you know, like like cite at the end of their paper actually are they justified by the results? Um, there, there's a lot of ways that like smart people can look into this and like uh, provide more context that would be important. So yeah, the the way we're thinking about this, there's kind of like a bunch of different design choices. So very curious to hear what you all think. 
but like kind of like at the most basic level, what we want to do is empower the average person to put money towards like a, a professional scientist coming in and leaving a post-publication peer review about the quality of a paper. So, so kind of like pub peer, but structured and with people being compensated for their time. And so like some of the interesting questions here are like, should these bounties be able to be pooled? Like if me, Lynn and Sapik are all interested in this, like, and I put 20 bucks and Sapik puts five bucks and Lynn puts like 150 bucks, like should that all be combined to the first person to leave like a, a quality peer review about the paper? Or should it be individual? Where like if I put a twenty dollar bounty, like maybe that's not enough for someone to like ever come in and actually review the paper. You know, maybe I actually have to put four hundred dollars in order to like you know appropriately incentivize a scientist or like the equivalent in research coin, you know, to appropriately incentivize a scientist to come in and share their expert opinion. Um, so yeah, that's the the first design choice is like individual bounties or collective pooled bounties. Um, yeah, so curious what you think. There's there's a bunch of other kind of aspects of this, but yeah, Lynn, what do you think? So I think um, I see benefits to like having both as an option personally, because I could very much see, I think that if you only had to go with one, unfortunately, you might have to go with individual just because I think there were people who would want to be able to post their own individual bounties. But I think that because I personally love the idea of being able to like start a crowdsourced bounty, like put in a certain amount and be like, hey, like if other people want to see this done, let's just like put money in until somebody claims it, you know? Um, so I actually really like the idea of the crowdsourced bounties, but I think that both have their place. And, and so I think like one uh, piece of context here too is like uh, th this would be for the V1. So it would be like, what's the first thing we ship? And like, we'll ship it like see what works, what doesn't work. Like if like uh, we get a lot of feedback that it's like, oh, hey, people only wanna put $20, but there's like 10 people who wanna put $20, then that helps inform us. Um, right. Yeah, or, or like we might be able to go to like a big funder like the Gates Foundation and they may be like, oh yeah, like we'll, we'll do like a hundred different papers at $300 a pop, you know, cause that's what we're interested in like trying to have happen in like the research ecosystem. So yeah, it's about thinking like, what's the first, iteration of this for us to like try and use to collect data in order to inform like further iteration yeah i mean overall i think the crowdsourcing would be kind of interesting you know if somebody posts a bounty just the ability to anybody to just like add on to it one thing i think in in support of the crowdsource thing is like um maybe there's a paper that i wouldn't put a hundred dollar bounty on but like if ricardo's put you know twenty dollars and edwin's put like thirty dollars I might put five, you know? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I could envision myself in situations like that frequently. Cool, Edwin. Um, so what's the argument for having individual bounties? It's like, easier to build. It's it's simpler. Like, um, in, in theory... That's it's not a good argument. Yeah, I, I think, like, a lot of times, like, in tech products, like... Uh, like if it requires an instruction manual, it's too complicated. And so like we'd have to figure out like a, a UX where it's clear that like you, you can, yeah, it, it's, it feels more straightforward in my mind to be like, I'm leaving a bounty, not like I'm contributing to a bounty. And then like if there's multiple people, like if, if we all put a bunch of bounties on it, like who gets to decide if the like, peer review that's left qualifies because like as we've kind of seen like on our comments like there's a there's a range you know of like quality and so like part part of this one of the other aspects that i was going to ask about is like how do you know when a quality peer review has been left you know but but yeah i think i think the pooled piece could it, it we we'd have to really think about the ui that like can make it clear that other people can add to the pot of a bounty. Um, there's probably lots we could borrow from like uh, like GoFundMe and like experiment.com, but yeah, we, we'd have to, th it, it would require a little bit more thought on our end of like exactly how we we build it out. Yeah, so from my perspective, you know, I, I, don't, I don't get why, 
I don't have a sense of how difficult it is from an engineering perspective, so I can't do pros and cons. But if we're looking at it purely functionally, I think it's overwhelmingly clear that having open bounties is better than individual. In fact, I don't even see a point to individual bounties, to be honest with you. So interesting. So, um, yeah, we'll come back to this in one second. Nick. Nick, I think you might be muted or there could be like an audio thing. Yeah, I can't hear either. Uh, Nathan? Yep. Hello, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah, I had a question and then I realized that your answer to Edwin's question helped me with my question. So my what I was going to say first was, is the plan to make the platform use primarily fiat currency or research coin? And then I thought, OK, what is the argument for using research coin in this scenario? Wouldn't most external people using this function just want to put up a dollar bounty for time that they've spent on a peer review? But actually, if you're having a crowdsourced bounty and you're looking for quality control, actually one of the features of research coin is that actually you could create a mini voting system within who the proportion of research coin that's been devoted to a certain peer review task. And then that could be the selling point of using research coin. So for example, if I put up 5,000 research coin for a peer review, you put up a thousand, I get five times the votes on the quality of the outcome uh, of the review that's that's been produced. And, and then I can say that, you know, I've got more sway when it comes to saying what the quality is. That, that could be one example. So, so you bring up a really important point um, because like w one thing that's pretty interesting is like the, the UX of crypto is not great. Like in, in general, like uh, to get research coin, like you either need to earn it, you know, by being part of the community or like plug into the standard crypto infrastructure. And a lot of people who might be interested, in, like we would be excluding a lot of people who might be interested in this if there wasn't like some kind of like, you know, standard fiat option. Um, so sometimes like some projects will do things where like, like this is a revenue generation feature, right? So uh, like in theory, like Research Hub will take like a, a percent fee for, for, for facilitating this and will likely have a percent fee go to like the community multi-sig as well. So we could do something where like um, the fee is way lower if you use Research Coin than if you use USD or something like that. And, and then also the added benefit here is that like, it's not like perfect tokenomics, but like it becomes a little bit more of a circular economy where like, you know, Wynn has been an incredible editor and she spent like a lot of time like creating valuable content. And so she's accrued research coin for doing that and now has more ability to bring criticism to the papers that she's interested in criticizing. So like it, it, it makes uh, it, it more compelling to provide like, high quality content within the research hub community because then you earn research coin and you're able to direct like the attention of like high quality scientists to criticizing papers. So it, it, it makes it, uh, it makes research coin more valuable in a certain aspect because you now are able to like, you know, like take smart people's time and direct it towards what you're interested in having it be directed to. Um, and so realistically, like long-term, I think we should probably do both where like, there's some massive advantage for using research coin over USD, you know, in some like certain direction or some kind of fiat. Um, Nick? Oh, I think the audio is still messed up. Sorry, um, Ricardo? Yeah, something that I was wondering is um, what is the, so we're talking about post-publication uh, review, right? So what is the, actual like outcome that we are expecting from this public post publication review just like to give a comment of on like what has been done or are we also planning to kind of be able to um replicate some studies if possible be like hey this doesn't add up to me i'm not like really buying this conclusion why don't we find out is this is actually you know true 
Because yeah. otherwise it's just like a comment for me. Because it could be a really bad comment, but it just like stays a comment. Uh, yeah, just my opinion. So yeah, I mean that's like the ultimate like end game that I think we'd like to get to, where like you know fortunately like five hours of researchers' time is like more affordable than like a whole research study to replicate something. But I do think like long term like this could turn into that where if there's demand, we get attention, you know, we have more resources, we're able to attract someone to spend, you know, like we could, we could start with kind of like low investment science, you know, where maybe it costs 10 K to like replicate a study or something. But yeah, that, I mean, that would be something where we're providing tremendous value to the scientific ecosystem. But, but I think like, uh, the idea here is like the, the parallel to Reddit, like, have you ever used like Reddit, like our technology, or like, I, I really like um, our immunopsychiatry, which is this like uh, study about how like, like changes in your or subreddit about how changes in your immune system can change the way you think essentially. And so like, sometimes I'll see papers and I'll click into the comments immediately just to see if some smart person has shared their opinion on the quality of the paper. There's even like news articles sometimes, like the top comment will be like really important context about like the, the news article itself. So it, it's something similar to that, where like when I see an article, you know, it says like, hey, like, you know, ivermectin is a really viable treatment, you know, for early COVID. The first comment could be like, yeah, like the study, like the authors, you know, like their results do match like their conclusions, but also it's really underpowered. And like there are a couple of different treatment groups and like I give it like a 6.5 out of 10 because I'm not totally convinced, but maybe there's something here, you know, which helps provide, I think, important context to like, like if somebody wanted to say ivermectin definitely, you know, could be used for treating COVID or ivermectin definitely can't, like you could go to Research Hub and see the context, you know. Um, uh, Nathan? So, sorry, just following on from what you were saying, um, I was just thinking about when you go back to that ivermectin example, um, a lot of the times I wonder whether people want to commission a peer review on claims that they've seen in the news, for example. So they might they might not have seen the study and said, can I have a peer review on this study? But they might say, oh, they're saying that ivermectin is an effective treatment for COVID. Can someone who's an expert on this topic actually go and summarize their their opinion on the literature for me? And so could you not perhaps commission literature reviews in the same way as like a peer review? Yeah, I actually think we totally could. Like, even it fits sort of with the hypothesis feature, which we haven't totally fleshed out. But we're thinking about changing this to kind of like like uh, meta studies to a certain degree. So somebody could say, "Hey, here's a topic that I'm interested in. Like, conduct a meta study. You know, that reviews like the most relevant like primary literature on the subject." So, so this would be like a little bit out of the scope of what we're hoping to build here during like the next two weeks. But yeah, I think I think there's a lot of directions that this could potentially go in that are interesting. It's the, the peer review one is, uh, I think, like nice from like a it's easier to do than a full meta study. Like it's probably like five hours of a person's time. And then it's also like kind of compelling from a marketing standpoint where we could share it around the Internet. And it's like, oh, you can get paid to do a peer review. You know, like I think there's both like both sides of like the people like providing demand for those peer reviews and the scientists providing supply is there. Like people, people want it and that option doesn't exist currently. Um, just, just to kind of like uh, bring things back to the first point here so we don't like, uh, you know, keep things moving. Um, when it comes to like pooled, like crowdsourced or individual bounties, does anybody feel like we should start with individual bounties? Or, or should we definitely start with like pooled, like, um, bounties that build up with multiple people contributing i prefer pool, pool. is it so is it um easier to start with individual than go collective yes I'm but if, sure. from an engineering perspective i'm not sure like, it would be easier but if we feel strongly that pooled is the better option it's it's technically possible for us to build that so if we want to invest our resources in that direction we just want to like make sure that there isn't a good argument to go with individual to start yeah, I don't see any reason for individual, to be honest. Yeah, I just 
it makes it more exciting to see like the bar for example like the progress bar like okay this is there's like uh, 20 bucks there's like 50 bucks and so on it kind of like makes you want to invest in that study and kind of like see see through so yeah I'm, I'm also you know i agree with edwin i think pool is uh pool is better it's an important point um jennifer um i might have missed um some of what you said at the beginning of the meeting but um as far as uh, this bounty system works can more than one person earn the bounty if they if you have multiple people who chip in a peer review for the same paper because i think there's a lot of value in getting multiple different opinions and if only one person gets that bounty because they're like the first one to write it then i think that would be a negative and that's where multiple individual bounties would be better because i think having multiple opinions is better it's it's another important point right because like if you have like a peer-reviewed paper there's normally at least like three peer reviewers you know like like reviewer two is always a pain in the butt kind of thing so yeah like i think there could be something where like maybe there's a maximum number of research coin for the first like peer review like maybe that's whatever the 400 dollars equivalent is and then after that it starts to create a bounty for the second person to leave a quality peer review like another important part here is like who gets to decide if a peer review qualifies as quality like the way that d work works is like uh people get assigned the task before they actually do it and like uh, another so it could be like ricardo applies for the bounty and then like if it's in lynn's hub or lynn's the editor lynn looks at ricardo's background looks at his posting history and is like yeah ricardo i think could do a good job and earn this bounty and then like there's an escrow where Ricardo eventually earns it once he posts the peer review and Lynn approves it. There, there's another version where it's almost more like a, like a design contest where like a bunch of people share peer reviews hoping to get the bounty. And then Lynn gets to decide which one she thinks, you know, is like most valuable in her hub or like, like uh, kind of as was suggested by Nathan, like, the higher percentage of the bounty that you contribute, like the more influence you have over deciding which reviews qualify. To me, this is a little bit dangerous though, because like, um, like I'm a big fan of mindfulness meditation, right? And so like, if I'm really interested in osteosarcoma pain, I might be less likely or less inclined to like value a peer review that rejects my opinion on something. So I think there kind of needs to be like an impartial referee to a certain extent, um, but I could be totally wrong there. So yeah, the, the the thing with this feature is the design space is huge in how we could actually implement it. Like it's a little bit more complicated than even pre-publication because there's like a, a solid like playbook there. So yeah, we, we could literally do anything. And it's about, I think, creating a first version that like we can use to collect data on how to improve it over time but jennifer you're absolutely right where like one peer review is not enough like there needs to be two and we could like do something where maybe even like like the community fund matches you know if like after the first 400 dollars worth of research coin is hit then like the community fund like one to one matches any research coin after that for the second peer review like there's yeah a lot of different cool things that we could do um nathan I really like your idea of a design contest type format and also any kind of design type contest format for, for, for designs of how you decide who gets to do a peer review and claim the bounty. Because I think the issue with the current system, let's just take D-Work, for example, is that it always incentivizes the person who's willing to do it for the least amount. Because let's say that you're adding the total of how much you're willing to pay for a certain article's peer review. When it gets to, let's say, you know, a grad student who's, you know, on their PhD stipend and, and wants to make some quick quick money, they, they will quickly accept that bounty and do the peer review for it. But let's say I'm an established professor, I've got a salary, I've got a lot of time commitments. This is interesting to me, but if the bounty is going to be interesting to me, it's got to be a lot higher than than that person. We shouldn't necessarily be saying that that we want to exclude the professor just because their two opinions are theoretically not in, in a way that their opinions are worth different amounts um, and so maybe you know one solution could be that a professor could reverse bounty and say this is what I'm willing to do it for if 
people can support me at this level or you know the design contest idea again is another way of, of, of incentivizing that i think another piece of this that's important to remember too is like this is a bonus like in theory if you share a high quality peer review like it'll probably attract upvotes and so you're going to be earning research coin just for creating high value content anyway so like if we go in the you know design contest perspective like and there's like a, a bunch of people who are interested in seeing a high quality peer review, like there will be a lot of eyes on the paper, a lot of upvotes to go around to people who like share quality peer reviews. And then maybe only the top one or two as decided by the editor of that hub actually received the bounty or something. So yeah, again, like the design space is gigantic here. And like, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot and I have no idea what the right answer is. So I think we'll, we'll probably, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll probably iterate a lot on it, but I think it's, well, it's pretty exciting. So, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I'm the only one on my heads up. Well, so other than the point that Jennifer brought up, uh, which is, you know, how to make sure you have multiple reviews and having, you know, individual bounties be a part of that. Um, what are some of the other arguments for individual bounties? I think it's, I think the most compelling one is that it's easier to explain. And like, it could be just a first good step, but, but I, even what Ricardo is saying, like, I totally get it where it's like, like when you go to GoFundMe, like the things that get funded the most are the ones that are like getting funded the most, you know, there's kind of like this exponential thing where like, you want to hop on the cool thing that other people think is cool. So, but yeah, I think there's a lot of value there just to like, kind of get that like social excitement going, uh, Nick. Okay. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, sorry, I'm, I may have missed the past five minutes as we started my computer. Um, but I just wanted to say that I think the idea of multiple people hopping on the same bounty is great, especially if those people are displayed as separate users on the bounty. Because I would think uh, for somebody trying to, or thinking of doing a peer review, five people offering a bounty of 20 research coin would be far more compelling than one person offering like 100. So having that list, I think, would help kind of get that momentum going as far as, you know, interacting between people, which is what Research Hub is looking to do, and kind of getting away from just the RSC balance and that being the only driver of that. I mean, it's a great point. And there's also like a, a certain part of this where it should probably be in your user profile too. So that way, when, when I go to Nick's profile, I can see like, oh, you know, Nick has spent money caring about like these topics and like wants to learn more about this stuff. He's supported like people like, you know, validating research. And so, yeah, totally the, the social aspect here is super important. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great point. So, so I guess like, but just to make sure that we nail this down for sure, does anyone here have like a, a positive thought when it comes to individual bounties or should we definitely start with pooled? Uh, Sapik. Yeah, uh, so in support of individual bounties, my uh, sort of initial assessment is this, uh, that it might be easier to get it rolling. Uh, so of course, from an engineering perspective, it's easier to build it. And then from sort of a sales perspective, it's easier to get one rich person to pay 200 bucks than it is to pay than it is to get like 10 people to pay 20 bucks right? uh, so it might help to sort of get it rolling and then of course i get that the people who are interested in it should have sort of a way to contribute to it. Uh, and for that we could have something uh, similar to what we have right now with the pot of code so uh, where authors can sort of claim their paper and get all the RSC from the upvotes. Uh, maybe everyone who's interested in sort of one review can upvote that review. Uh, and then whoever claims it gets the 200 bucks that the original sort of person had put it put in there. And then also a pot of code uh, from the support there. That's my, uh, my point there. I actually like that a lot because it kind of reminds me a little bit of like our initial thought of like the Rotten Tomatoes review where you have like the expert review and then like the the like, you know, uh, audience review where maybe like the peer review that the editor decided, you know, deserves a bounty isn't the one that's most popular, you know, among the users. Again, I think like we need to have some kind of weighted upvote here where like experts in the field like are 
their opinion of a review is probably more qualified than just like the average person. So there needs to be like some, in my mind at least, there needs to be some element of like weighted reputation per hub. And we don't have that yet. But I, I do love the idea of like, you can see, you know, what's like the populist, you know, view versus like, what does the editor team, you know, within that hub, like think is actually quality. And I think there's important context there for sure. Um, okay, cool. So I guess like, does anybody else have a positive view of individual bounties before we move on? Uh, Nathan? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just trying to find a reason, like sort of playing <laughs> devil's advocate. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, one thing is obviously this feature involves people investing in an idea. And with that comes the trust of the people who are involved, especially if they're external users and not core users to Research Hub. It's probably a lot easier to manage if there are bugs and things don't quite work out the way you are if it's a one-to-one -one peer reviewer to supporter ratio. And so if you aren't 100% confident in the robustness of you know, the back end, maybe starting out with one-to-one -one is a good way of easing into it. And then when you're confident that works, expand it to, okay, a max of 10 and then a max of 100. What you don't want is start with 10,000. They all lose their money. It gets right. bad publicity <laughs> and you just pull it from the beginning. Totally. Totally. It, it's a great point. And I think like uh, we're trying to ship this within the next two weeks. So like all of these kind of design decisions will be made within that context of like we want to ship something that works. And like our goal is to produce one dollar revenue by like not this Friday, but the next Friday. So yeah, this that'll be up to Kobe and Pat and our engineering team in order to like make that like, you know, risk reward decision of what can we build within two weeks that works, you know, that isn't gonna break, you know, that we can get that one dollar revenue from in order to start being a real business. Um, cool. Yeah, so so I think we can move. I think we've got a lot of good feedback and like it seems like pooled is definitely like the preferred option here. So like I'll report back once uh, I sync up with like Kobe and Pat and see what we think we can build within two weeks. Um, so the next important question here is like, who's deciding if a peer review, you know, is quality? Like it is, I, I guess like the, the more important part here is like, are we going design contest? Or is it something where uh, I apply to be able to share a peer review? And there's some kind of judgment before like time is spent writing the peer review um, to, to like make sure only people with the appropriate like knowledge about the paper would actually review it. Wait, to make sure only the people with the appropriate knowledge review or would uh, review a review? Like is it DWORK style where people apply to collect the bounty. Mm -hmm. And then the editor decides, yes, like Edwin, you know, he's got the background that's appropriate. Like he gets sure. the first shot and then you share it and then it's approved and then you collect the bounty. Or is it like, uh, like I share a bounty and then Edwin, Nick and Sadvik all write peer reviews. And then Ricardo's like, oh yeah, Nick's is the most quality. Like this is actually relevant. It's like the best, you know, like, like criticism of the paper most fair and we we give the editor the power to determine like what you know which which peer review fulfills the bounty the best i would definitely go for the second one like in my opinion that in that way you first you create interaction under the post so instead of having just one comment you get like i don't know like five different people actually doing the review you can kind of like get also like cross comments, like people commenting under like the reviews one. And in that way, you're not kind of like excluding someone before they actually give their opinion on that. And then you can just like judge the comment based on, you know, the the, the quality of the comment itself. Uh, I don't know if I got that wrong. If it's just like- Doesn't that just add a lot of risk to doing that work though? Because you you know you put a bunch of time into it and then you just don't get paid for it. That just that devalues it substantially in my mind. The bounty. I, I think like, with, with with the context of you can still get upvotes. So yeah. like it, like you wouldn't get the bounty. You know there is risk in that you might not get the bounty, but you will if you create something of value and other people perceive it as valuable. Like with our new reward structure, you could still be you know like relatively handsomely compensated for your time 
Yeah, like if you could, the- if you could, sorry, uh, if you could tweak, um, perhaps, because we're talking about how reputation scores will affect the percentage of research coin that goes to your wallet. So if people who do those and they're not like complete, or I don't know, maybe likes from that can lead to a disproportionate value accrual in some way that you know I'm not thinking about right now. But I would say that. Um, you know, taking the time to your your upside uh, when you take the time to do something like a peer review should be higher than your upside for commenting on a paper, and like because that's just more work. So you have to find a way to account for that value. And I would, I think, if you make it somewhat more deterministic, there's less risk associated with it. So people who may not, you know, have that much time to put and just to see what happens would still feel like okay this is something that's worth doing so Mm -hmm. i would consider that maybe there's a third option here where the editor is responsible for saying which submissions are eligible to receive the bounty and then it's done by votes after that so basically just screening out the low quality ones and then you let the community decide you know like which one receives the most upvotes Just, just a thought that's a little bit more complex but um, no, no. Well, if you sorry, one thing. But if you're doing that, that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Because the purpose of the researcher choosing who does the bounty based on evaluating the background or whatever is to screen for expertise. So I don't understand why you would do that and then have the community, who presumably does not have the expertise, decide which peer review gets the value. That doesn't make sense to me. I guess my thought is like our early community. It probably wouldn't work at scale. But our early community, I feel like everybody here, the incentives are aligned and we're all scientists and we kind of know, like you can look at a peer review and you kind of know if it's like pretty good or not, you know. Um, Joanna, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I think on Edwin's thoughts to reduce the risk, I mean, maybe we can start with a fixed reward for a peer review and then the editor can like delegate on other rewards. I th- I think that makes the most sense to me because it feel like I feel like our editors are awesome and like it feels simple and like we could you know we could have people hate on us and then we can change it you know but that feels like a good way to get started that's like simple it makes enough sense you know and that's kind of what editors do at a real journal anyway so it's kind of close. Um, um, I guess going back to something Edwin said about, um, well, I think you were talking about expert versus community and uh, feedback on on peer reviews as to who gets um, why why community members would even really have much of a say. I guess one thing is that sometimes um, certain certain comments are easier to understand. For someone who's maybe not an expert and i think that's very valuable if it's being communicated in a way that um, someone who doesn't have the background to understand the paper can understand the comment and and get some insights and, and understanding as to what's going on and then in that way i think there's there's value to getting um community input well that's that's an important point where you almost incentivize the peer reviewer to phrase things without jargon like you you can still you know be technically excellent but mm-hmm. choose to use phrasing that you know will resonate with the average person more so than other experts in the field. That's a, that's a super good point. That's definitely something we need to think about. Um, Nick? So I was, I was just thinking about the situation where let's say someone puts up a bounty of like a thousand RSC and there's three or four excellent peer reviews. There's one that's better than the others, but the others are, are really good in their own. Um, what would be kind of neat, I think, is if there was like a if, if you put up a thousand RSC, there's a percent of that that's also held in escrow for other reviews, which are good in their own right, but possibly not the best one. Because I, I worry about somebody maybe having their first foray into the peer review. They write a really great one, but it's not the best, and then they get nothing for it, and they might be de-incentivized to do that in the future. But maybe like a little kind of lower value, but they still get something for their time could help kind of keep that going. Yeah, totally. Cause especially if it's like a new person to the platform and they spend time, they don't get it. So, so I'm thinking here, like the, the MVP solution is like, if, if like Ricardo and Joanna both share like really quality peer reviews, but only one is selected by the editor, I'll come in and support them with the same as the bounty. 
So like we can manually make sure that the person who shared the other quality peer review, even if they didn't earn the bounty, they still got compensated like they did, you know, and then like long term, we can, you know, like kind of iron out the wrinkles, but we, we can manually make sure like people, if people are spending time, you know, creating quality content, we can make sure that they earn value for doing so in like kind of a manual uh, perspective. But yeah, it's a great point where we don't want to like have someone spend five hours working on a piece of content and then like not get anything for it. That's yeah. Hopefully I also we'll... think, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I know we've talked about this before, but a lot of these stuff, these things, uh, you know, the, the solution space gets broader once we include NFTs. Right. Totally. And, you know, so I just wonder about the extent to which delaying implementing NFTs is like a, a good idea. Um, yeah, that's, you know, there's, there's just a lot that we could be doing with that, you know. Yeah. We're thinking about it. And, and we actually had like a pretty long discussion today during our engineering sync about it, because like we're, we're thinking about a revenue model. Right. And one of the choices is NFTs, because that's like a pretty popular, you know, like Web3 way to make money. Like there's a lot of like validated business models around NFTs that make a lot of sense. The the tough thing is like um we probably couldn't do it in two weeks and have it make sense. Like yeah, it, it, there's a lot to think through, especially when it comes to like actually generating revenue from it. Like we mm -hmm. can help people mint NFTs along with their comments and stuff like that. But like the only real revenue generation there for us is like a percentage of future trades and then that creates a bunch of weird incentives where like you want to create an nft that gets traded a lot not necessarily one that people want to hold on to which you know who knows what that is so it's tricky it's really tricky and like i think we'd have to get it right so yeah it's to me nfts are high risk high reward and this is something where we can like i'm pretty sure this is valuable like this is like I see the use case and like, I think we could convince scientists that it is valuable and like scientists want to get paid for peer review. So this sort of feels like, you know, in two weeks feels, it feels safer and like, yeah, the oh, use yeah. case just makes sense. Um, yeah, but NFTs are definitely on the radar. <laughs> I think that's, that's the, you know, that's the, like the, the great white whale that we want to get to eventually. But like, yeah, I think like, it's, we're going to think through it and make sure we do it right, hopefully. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I guess like it seems like the design contest style where the editor um, picks a winner and maybe there's two after a certain level bounty, maybe the, the max of $400 or whatever, like people can still add bounties to it. And then maybe that goes to the second one. And we just make sure Research Hub compensates anyone who produces high quality peer reviews of a paper, no matter what. Um, does that sound right? Does anybody disagree? I guess Ricardo first and then. No, oh, yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure that it was still like a contest. So basically you have like a like bunch of people actually like posting the review and you select the best. Because once so, something that I was thinking about is if you select the reviewer before, you kind of like get into the same problem that we're facing now with like traditional peer reviews that you got like crappy reviews and you can do like nothing about it because you already selected the reviewer. So I think that is where we want to innovate. So we allow everyone to get into the competition, let's say, for of peer review, and then we kind of like select the best. But we still reward those that have, you know, did a, did kind of like did a good job. And, and Ricardo, you're like spot on. Where like like unfortunately in social media, like the thing that attracts the most attention is like disagreement and controversy, right? And so like there's something really cool where like I'm an author. I shared a paper, somebody put $400 for a bounty to peer review my paper. And then one person comes in, tears my paper apart. Another person comes in and says, eh, this is okay. Like I can respond to the first person, right? Like if it's an unfair peer review, like I can say, hey, <laughs> you know, like I get what you're saying, but like I you know, respectfully disagree. And then the editor can see the context there and be like, oh, this author actually kind of has a point. But you can have that discussion which is like so compelling, I think. Like, that kind of reminds me of like, when you leave like reviews on TripAdvisor and you actually see the, like the people from the restaurant that actually replies like, hey, like it didn't go like, as you said. So like, well, what's it, what, what are you saying? Like, it didn't go that, that way. Yeah, that, that, that totally makes sense to me. Totally. Yeah, and like in that situation, it's a little he said, she said. And in this situation, it's all in the paper. 
right? So it's like any person, you know, I wasn't there when I didn't pay my hotel bill and the guy got angry at me, right? But like, you know, anybody can look at the paper and see if the criticism is, you know, they, they were there for the security footage that saw me not pay my hotel bill and they can, you know, know if the criticism is valid or not. Um, so yeah. 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 My point was regarding, uh, potentially wasting someone's time, uh, right? Uh, so one of the ideas that I had was, could there be sort of a version-based uh, feature for this, where people post sort of the very first draft of their peer review and then uh, build upon it, and then a, they can be stopped in the initial versions if sort of the community or the editors think that uh, their sort of contribution would not be that meaningful. Could there be some way of that so that nobody has to spend like six hours on something and then have it rejected? Uh, could there be something like that? Yeah, so I think you're you're getting to the thing that we're most excited about long term, which is like pre-publication peer reviews and the ability to have version control for all content on Research Hub, where like yeah, like I think the the most applicable use of this is I share a preprint, I get a peer review. I now have a version two of my paper. I get another peer review. I now have a version three. I get another, it's accepted, boom, peer reviewed. You know, just like a standard journal process. But then we could also do that for the peer reviews themselves, you know, where like maybe, you know, somebody like is like a grad student or something and tries to share a peer review, but they miss like an important part. And then they come back with V2 of their peer review. And it's like, it can be an educational experience where they like get, you know, like, like a constructive feedback on their peer review and like, you know, like from that become better over time. And I, I think that's like super compelling, especially when it comes to like breaking down the ivory tower and like giving anyone the opportunity to like learn from and participate in science. So, so yeah, that's, that's where we want to be long-term. And I think, I think this is going to get us there like over the course of six months or so. So we'll see, but that's definitely what we're thinking of long-term. Um, Nick? So I just wanted to bring up a point I just realized. Um, so if I'm submitting a paper for publication in a journal and it's reviewed by reviewers, they don't see each other's review. Whereas on Research Hub, if I'm going to peer review a paper, I'm able to see what the previous peer reviewer has put. So that is a little dangerous as far as the second person taking all of those ideas. And then if they only have three or four novel of their own, there could be something. Um, I'm wondering if they're could be like a some sort of blinding system where if you want to be a peer reviewer, you can see that people have peer reviewed it, but you can't see what they said, or just the 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 vulnerability of somebody else coming in and stealing all of my ideas and then putting their two novel, and now all of a sudden they have far more just because of that. Yeah, there's there's definitely something to that for sure, and, and I think like like this makes me think of the the pre publication flow where we'd actually have editors invite people to peer review and maybe if you're going through that flow you show up in a blinded fashion where like maybe we you don't even come to research hub we send you the pdf you know you do it outside of research hub and that you know page for whatever reason is blocked for you um it's it's a great point and i think like for this version like like the way that i think about this is like the first time that happens then it'll be clear to us we need to fix it you know but yeah, like perfect. it'll happen once and then we'll be like, okay, yeah, we need to do something here. Um, yeah, but it's a great point because like it, people will definitely get biased and hopefully we'll have timestamps too. So we'd be able to like kind of like point to like somebody who said something first in theory. Um, definitely, cool. Uh, Nathan, and then I want to get to the to the last piece here that I think is uh, interesting to, to figure out. Yeah, sure, I'll be really quick. Uh, I was just trying to think of how we integrate the design context idea with um, facilitating multidisciplinary peer review because I mean my idea like my utopia for peer review would be if a statistician could come in and say I'm going to look at the stats in this paper and then a computer scientist could say well I'm looking at the computer science aspect and then, you know the biologist or whatever looks at the real basic science core aspect and and really that none of those individuals could come up with the best peer review but together they could obviously come up with the best peer review. And maybe, maybe they team up before they make the peer review, like you know our editors have done in the past, and then submit a joint peer review to, to, to win the prize. But 
but you know I, I feel like the best version of research hub is when people who don't even know each other would would somehow team up just based on a spontaneous interest in a in a paper so i don't know how we, we facilitate that yeah so that's that's really compelling like if it like i think there's two ways to do this like we were kind of talking about during like the previous two community calls where our peer review feature right now is sort of just an empty field right where like you can kind of peer review however you want but i think we're going to get to the point where it's like categories right and it's like you know was the statistical methodology like chosen appropriately and like executed properly right and then like you know were the what was the like actual methodology for the paper like does it like you know was it you know high quality enough to support the author's claims like there's a lot of different categories there and i think like the, like our our like mandate here is to do something to make money and i think like if there's demand like we're gonna work on this feature a lot and like the interesting thing that you said is like does it happen in chunks or do they get together beforehand like do we connect people to become like a review team where it's like you've got you know like you recruit a statistician to come to your like eln you know organization and it's like hey we're reviewing this paper this week like join our google meets we're going to talk about it and then assign you know different tasks and then we publish it together with everyone as a co-author and we all earn the bounty in different ways like that's really cool because that's like very social and i think our eln like actually this that pretty well it's very compelling um so that, that's a great idea i think we should definitely do something like that and it, assuming we're able to get some people to like want to spend money like 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 creating peer review bounties like it will become a huge focus for our team and we'll make it super robust and like try and do whatever we can to make it attractive for scientists to want to come in and, and networking is like a, a big piece of that for sure um okay cool yeah so the the last piece here with the last five minutes is like in theory this is revenue generation right so the way that i'm kind of thinking about this is like we're already in gravy territory for scientists because right now like when you write a peer review it's kind of like a professional obligation you know you're you're doing labor for a for-profit company almost like because it's a guilt trip you know like you have to kind of you know like we're like more delicately put than that but like that's the essence of it and so like in theory research hub you know will be able to create revenue from this and like we'll be able to like grow as an organization and so like the most obvious way to do that is like a, a fee. Questions here is what does that fee look like? Like what's the size of the fee? Is it 50%? Is it 25%? Is it 10%? Is it 5%? And then how much of that goes to Research Hub Inc? And how much of it goes to the community multisig? Because I do think that like, like one, thing that i actually have a lot of respect for scientists about don't love for-profit companies generally and so like i think it's important that like if i'm gonna be spending money to help create a peer review like a portion of it is returned to the community like it's like you know it it makes me want to spend more money right if i know like a portion of it's going back to help like you know create more content or like support the people who are most active within the community and so like I have like a little bit of an idea, like um, if you look at like GoFundMe, like they have a percentage they take, you know, of donations. If you look at Patreon, they have a percentage, experiment.com. And so what what makes sense to you all when it comes to like what's Research Hub Inc's cut that ends up going to profit? And then what is the tax that goes to the community, you know, in order to be like reinvested in any way the community wants it to be? Is Edmund? I'm not sure. Do we need a tax going to the community? Because if they're taking money and buying research coin, they're already like increasing the price of the token. So, I mean, I don't know. Do we actually need, you know, a substantial amount of that money going to the community? I, I just, the food for thought out there is to understand that with each purchase, these people are, you know, decreasing the supply of research coin, and that's good for us. So, 
it's true and so one one piece of this too is like um like we're really lucky to have jeff around because he's provided some like really valuable criticism when it comes to our tokenomics and like one issue here is like if i'm a scientist and i like am i doing the peer review to get more research coin to then like put bounties on peer reviews for other papers to a certain degree yes but also i think most people probably want to go get dinner after work right like they'll want to sell it you know maybe not 100 percent of it but like it doesn't totally solve the problem because there has to be a way that like research coin gets taken out of circulation to actually you know decrease the supply and so one thing that research hub inc can't do is burn tokens but the community might want to vote to send it to a null wallet you know like who knows you know so like having a certain portion go to the community provides flexibility where maybe the community wants to invest it, you know, in scientists who like, you know, want to conduct their own experiments, or maybe they want to send it to a null wallet or who knows, like uh, eventually. Like, Why can't in, you guys burn it again? I'm confused. It's a, it's a securities risk. We, we can't unilaterally do that. Um, at least okay. my current understanding. So like who knows it might be different next year like no one knows <laughs> um, it, it's something that we're we're currently advised not to do so um yeah and and even i think like um like eventually you know we have i, I believe it's like 12 years worth of research coin like set out to the community you know in order to like be distributed but like eventually we're going to have to mint new tokens in order to replenish that pot but that could be significantly spread out if there's actually revenue going into the community like maybe like if you know certain percentages going back into the community multi-sig maybe that all of a sudden becomes instead of 12 years it's 14 years right and like everyone gets diluted less when that eventually happens so yeah to me i, I hear what you're saying edwin we're like it, we definitely don't have to have some go back to the community but like it feels like it becomes more palatable to spend money when it is and like i think there's interesting things that could be done through community vote that research hubbing can't do so yeah any any other thoughts nathan yeah so i guess um the question of what the fee should be how big should it be what percentage are we looking at i think it will be viewed in the context of what is someone getting from research hubbing for using their website like why can't i just use a D work for peer review. Why can't I just post this is what I'm willing to pay for this peer review and, and we can post it on Twitter? Like, do you know what I mean? And so I guess part of it is security. And that's why I think that will be really important that like th these these you know contributions will need to be safe and, and honored and people will have to feel like their funds are not at risk because that, that's part of the value add. But then obviously the the ux design is what the engineers time has been going into which is what what this revenue is trying to pay for um but i think it, it would be worth even just thinking about okay how do we market that that value add to people who are using the site for the first time as a justification for their fee because i feel like patreon and you know well patreon in particular but maybe uh, just you know all the other crowdfunding sites to some extent get this criticism of like if we're the ones doing this what what is the justification other than building building a website that that, that has justified this fee on, on the back end it's a great point i, I think that this is something where there's a lot of room for criticism um and that's why like that's why we're talking about it really because it should be like a community decision to a certain degree and like like we don't want to do something that like you know, doesn't feel good <laughs> to the early supporters of Research Hub. So the, the other piece of this too, that I think is important to like keep in mind is like, there's this like cognitive thing where people like to be like given stuff. They don't like to have stuff taken away from them. So I think like for the first iteration of the fee, it's better to start high and come down than it is to start low and go up. So, you know, just cause like, yeah, just, feels bad to <laughs> be like, okay, we started at 5%, but it really needs to be eight, you know, but it feels better if it's like we started at like 10%, but it really needs to be eight. And so, yeah, there's, there's a piece of that to where like, we have no idea what the demand will be. Like, this is very much just throwing darts at a wall. Like we don't, yeah. 
and, and like like hopefully like we'll be a public company someday and like people will be able to see you know if we're making the same profit margin as like you know elsevier like that's not ideal so like yeah i think i think it's something that will be tweaked you know over time based on what actually happens um yeah, so so does anybody have numbers they want to throw out like i can say what i'm thinking you know if that makes sense to just like ground the conversation but yeah if anybody has like any first thoughts you know let me know jennifer says 10 percent, and then jennifer would that be 10 percent to research hub or is that like a research hub inc or is that like five percent to research hub inc and five percent to the community what? or is it eight percent to research hub inc and two percent to the community like what does that look like to you I was thinking a total of 10% um, cut, and I hadn't thought about the division. I would guess, um, yeah, I, I don't know. But I would say 10% just would be, I would feel comfortable with that being a cut that's not going directly to the peer review. Fair. Um, anybody else have any ideas? If it's, 10%, what are we thinking the floor will be? You mean like like long term? No, not long term. Are we uh are we gonna if we're putting bounties, is it are we gonna have um like th there should be an amount like like we were talking about where the you know it's at least four hundred the equivalent of four hundred dollars or something like that. So my point is if we're doing ten percent, are we just gonna do it ten percent of whatever or are we gonna set a floor for what the a bounty floor for what the peer review um, is. Yeah, I think would just to be simple, it'd probably be like, like if somebody wanted to complete the bounty for like, you know, the $40 equivalent of research coin, then the fee would be $4. Um, okay. you know, at 400, it would be 40, that kind of thing. If 10% okay. if was the number we wanted to start with. Um, Nathan? Okay. Are you, um, are you set on a percentage amount? Or so I'm now thinking of like, index fund providers like could you have a flat fee or you know a tiny percent but a higher flat fee so that it, okay per post it's worth it but we're not going to gouge 10 percent if like ten thousand people come together to, to support a, a peer review topic because you know is, is is that really justified is that percentage justified by the ui design that that so many people came together maybe maybe not do you know what i mean because because what you're doing is then discouraging people from marketing it themselves to drive it, it, it's almost like you're doing marketing for research i think at that point rather than your own peer review, you know? it, it's it's a great point like you, this is just the first kind of form i think it could literally be anything and like hopefully you know like just for us to be supported as a company hopefully like over the next year or two it'll be enough to cover our burn um but yeah anything past that you know i think we can be really creative with it there's even like what you reminded me of is like maybe like it's if under 400 you know research hub inc gets all the 10 percent. but then if it's like a thousand it becomes 50 50 and then if it's like ten thousand, research hub inc gets two percent and the community gets the other eight you know it's like as more goes more goes the community like there's yeah we can get creative with it and i think we'll probably experiment with different things to see what is the most compelling but yeah, it's it's a great point. We could literally do anything. So if anybody has any suggestions, like feel free to DM me or like post in the community, you know, chat. Because yeah, we could do anything, and we'll probably try a bunch of different stuff to see what sticks. Uh, Sapis. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would it make sense to keep a very low fee, but then uh, sell sort of a premium account uh, for people who want to do this so maybe a monthly fee on uh, on maybe a monthly fee for people who want to sort of put up these boundaries uh, and then we take a very small fee out of it but this be a model that we work yeah it's definitely possible like kind of like subscription models i think are pretty popular and yeah so maybe yeah like even maybe you need to like uh, like stake coins in order to peer review or something like that. Um, yeah, there's yeah again like the design space is gigantic and like our biggest concern is like trying to cover our burn, you know, to to be sustainable as a company. And then after that, like like I don't yeah I don't know like I don't I think there's other cooler things we could 
provide in order to try and make a whole bunch of money. I don't think peer review is the one that we would want to like make a whole bunch of money off of. So um, yeah, I think the design space is huge. And, and I guess like just to add context, like in my mind, 8% was what I was thinking because that's what experiment.com does. That's what um, uh, like I'm pretty sure Patreon does 8%. And so one other thing that happens here is like they use payment providers. And so payment providers typically take like two or three percent. So like of that eight percent, like five percent goes to Patreon. So like if we have research coin, like we could maybe do something where it's like eight percent for research coin, where three percent goes to the community, research hub takes home five percent. But if you want to use USD, it's gonna be twelve percent, you know, where three percent like you know gets admitted to the community and research hub takes home the dollars or something. Like there's a lot of different things, but like in my mind, eight percent was like the kind of like standard when it comes to like crowdfunding websites. So I think it, I think it would make sense to start with 10% and then move it down if we need to, or like, you know, 10% with 3% going to the community. Yeah, like so, something like that. But that's 8% I think is the standard for like, not late stage companies, but like mature companies that are like, you know, are, I don't know if Patreon is actually profitable or GoFundMe. I'd have to look into that. But that's, I know experiment.com is like kind of sustainable and they do it at 8%, but they're also very small. I think it's like two people. Cool. Yeah, so we're, we're about 10 minutes over now. And there were a bunch of other topics that we'll have to um, talk about next week. But like this to me is extremely exciting because I, I think the peer review thing is cool. And we've gotten a lot of like, very good peer reviews so far from our community. So I know like we have the talent here for people like already here, like finding people who want to spend bounties is going to be easy because we already have demonstrated that we have the ability to provide like high quality peer reviews of papers. And so I think that this is going to work and it's pretty exciting because of that, especially if it comes with like no potential sustainability, <laughs> you know, in six months, 12 months, something like that. So. Yeah, I guess uh, any final thoughts on this topic? Um, again, like it's something we'll be working on for a while. So yeah, as as we build it, like feel free to DM me or post in the community chat or DM Kobe and Pat who are gonna be like leading the development of it. Cool. That sounds great. I'm very excited to see it. Yeah, thanks everybody for the opinions. And then uh, we'll, we'll catch up on all the other topics next week too. So yeah, thanks for staying over too. Um, it's great to see everybody again. Bye. See Bye everyone. Thanks guys.